opportunity. Oil stocks were already gaining because of the automobile industry growth, and after the Supreme Court decision, Standard Oil stock burst upward, making Rockefeller immediately even more wealthy and powerful. Rockefeller and Standard Oil still controlled 70% of the oil refining in the United States, and there were no more legal hurdles to face. John D. Rockefeller Jr. was groomed in a privately owned exclusive Rockefeller school called the Browning School, and then attended Brown University. In 1901, he married the daughter of Senator Nelson Aldridge of Connecticut and was later in charge of the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company when the United Mine Workers of America staged a 14-month strike against the Rockefeller Company. On April 20, 1914, an assault on the striking coal miners was ordered and during the attack by the Colorado National Guard on a tent colony of the miners and their families at Ludlow, a battle ensued claiming the lives of 17 miners and family members, three guardsmen, and a bystander. This demonstrated the tactics of the Rockefeller establishment. Rockefeller Jr. was made to testify for three days to a chairman of the Commission on Industrial Relations about the Ludlow Massacre. The consequences against the Rockefellers were negligible, but not so for the victims and their families. The Magna Carta of Great Britain stated that the charging or collecting of interest carried the death penalty. It was not until William the Orange of the Netherlands of the Habsburg bloodline, who married Queen Mary and created the Bank of England in 1694, that the Magna Carta was circumvented in Great Britain. Central banks owned by the Habsburgs had already been spawned in other countries, like the Bank of Amsterdam in 1609 in the Netherlands, the Bank of Hamburg in 1619 in Germany, and the Bank of Sweden formed in 1661. These Habsburg banks were enriched by the fiat principle of lending money which existed on paper, only minimally backed by gold. This money out of air was then lent to governments, which were charged interest on this debt through taxation of its citizens, thus empowering the banking families as overlords. Alexander Hamilton, as Secretary of the Treasury, created the Bank of the United States, which was privately owned and lent money to the United States, creating immediate debt, but it caused so much poverty and rebellion that it was shut down. However, the Second Bank of the United States was created to fund the War of 1812, owned by the Bauer Rothschilds family of Frankfurt, Germany. Germany had also lent money and mercenaries out during the Revolutionary War of the United States. In 1832, President Andrew Jackson vetoed a bill to extend the charter of a Rothschilds Second Bank of the United States, from which the U.S. had borrowed monies to wage the War of 1812. Jackson denounced the central bank as unconstitutional and a curse to a republic inasmuch as it is calculated to raise around the administration moneyed aristocracy dangerous to the liberties of the country. The Rothschilds family retaliated when in 1835 an assassination attempt was made by Richard Lawrence. The attempt failed and Jackson successfully pulled the United States funds out of the second bank. Jacob Rothschild's puppets in the Senate censured Jackson but the censure was annulled in 1837, and by the time Andrew Jackson had left office, he had completely eliminated the entire national debt. A stepping stone to European banking control of the U.S. came with the National Banking Act of 1863 during the Lincoln administration, but it was oil profits that catapulted their cartel into the stratosphere of power. When the Spindletop oil field discovery was stolen from Higgins by Lucas and Andrew Mellon's bank, Gulf oil was born, further enriching the banking and oil cartel. The Warburg family, represented by Felix and Paul Warburg, consolidated large-scale banking operations in New York City in 1901, where they purchased partnerships in the investment firm of Kuhn, Loeb & Company. Rockefeller crony Jacob Schiff was a senior partner. The German banker Paul Warburg representing the Habsburgs and centuries-old European banking families, began advocating for central banking in the United States as early as 1907, propagandizing in the New York Times with articles like A Plan for a Modified Central Bank. A clandestine meeting of several top bankers occurred on the premise of duck hunting on Jekyll Island off of Georgia.